So you have been talking about the potential dangers of U.S. manufacturing moving offshore for a very long time, before the president was elected largely on this issue. Uh, is this the type of scenario you were worried about? No, this is uh, the type of scenario I was worried about on steroids. Let me talk about what I was looking at during the 2000s. I saw primarily the Chinese Communist Party engaged in all manner of unfair trade practices designed to take us apart and the world apart, whether it was sweatshop labor, pollution havens, massive subsidies, the use of state-owned enterprises to attack our sectors. What I was concerned about was the loss of our manufacturing base in smaller and medium-sized communities where they would be hollowed out and would be, we would be left with an economy which could not grow fast and which could not generate wage increases. And as a collateral damage, we would have a defense industrial base which simply could not defend us. Now, up to Donald Trump, that's exactly what we were getting, and, and, and all the opioid addiction and alcoholism and crime on top of that. Well, I, I'd like to just kind of stay focused on, on COVID-19. This, this is, is a different kind of danger. What we have now is a world which has basically pulled offshore the bulk of our manufacturing capacity for personal protective equipment, for medical supplies, for medical uh, equipment like ventilators, and for pharmaceuticals in particular, our, our foreign pharmaceutical dependence is astronomical. It's the key starting materials that make the active pharmaceutical ingredients that go into our finished dosage form capsules, tablets, and injectables. All three phases of that manufacturing process are in places like China and India and Ireland, all for a different set of reasons. And this pandemic has shown a bright light on the dangers because something like over 80 countries during this pandemic has put some form of export restrictions on what we need as a country to protect our public health. And that's why we're using the Defense Production Act so aggressively to, to right that problem. And we'll get to the DPA in just a couple of minutes. But let's talk about what's happening on the ground across the United States right now. We are months into this pandemic, and we are still seeing healthcare workers, doctors, really people on the front lines going to work every day without the personal protective equipment that they so desperately need. I, I would challenge you on that in the, in the following sense is uh, I'm very actively engaged with HHS and FEMA building up the strategic national stockpile. Our version is what we call 2.0. What we inherited from the Obama-Biden administration was essentially an empty cupboard. When this pandemic started, we had very little to fight it with, and it wasn't organized intelligently or strategically. We are in a position now, using things like the Defense Production Act, where we're well on our way by the end of September to filling that stockpile. At the same time, every time we get a request, every time we get a request now from a hospital anywhere around the country, we will endeavor to fill it immediately. So this, this, these stories that we're seeing in the press, we push back on them every day. So we you have what we need to get to people what they need, and it, it, the only problem there would ever be would be some lack of communication, but we've got what people need. So do you dispute these reports from nurses and doctors? You would have to show me your exact report. We will look at it. We run every day at 11 a.m. We come in with what happened over the last 24 well, hours. There was, there was a, a And one section of that report is all of the stories that uh, would make claims about maybe we're not getting somewhere, something somewhere. And what we do is, first of all, check the veracity of it. And if it's true, we get, we get planes in the air or trucks. Uh, I, we have a, I have a tremendous ability. I can, get, I, can, I can move stuff in hours out of the warehouses, and I've done that 
multiple times. So yeah, I, I, guess I mean, I, I you're, just, you're I just, dealing with anecdotes, well, I, I not, just not ask the true very, story well, very, at this point in time. Very clearly, yes. do you think that there is enough PPE right now in this country for nurses and doctors? Yes, I do. I th uh, we're, we're, if you just simply look at all the production uh, that, we, that we are engaged in, we're net filling the strategic national stockpile. And like I say, if there's a hospital around the country that needs something, let us know. If, uh, if there's a distributor, this is, the way this works also is, is you've got the stockpile and then that goes to a distributor like Cardinal or McKesson and then they are able to get it to the hospitals or physicians. So we, we feel like, based on what we've done with the Defense Production Act under President Trump's leadership, that we've made great strides. Now, um, well, going I, forward. I just want yeah. to ask you one thing. Yeah. Dr. Cadillac in March estimated that we were going to need about 3.5 billion N95s if this reaches pandemic status, which obviously it has. Uh, we spoke to FEMA and they told us that we are producing something like 160 million N95 masks a month, but that still doesn't equal 3.5 well, billion. So I yeah, just want to ask you, I mean, I would caution have you adjusted you, I those numbers? I would caution you that, that if you're citing projections in March and we're sitting here in August, that you, 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 you might want to get an August projection. What I'm telling you is that uh, by the end, and this is all in the, in the report that I issued today, uh, by the end of September, we, we will have uh, a, a strategic national stockpile that's, that's very uh, full. Uh, but look, we are at war. Let's make no mistake about that. This is a war against a deadly virus from China that looks like the Chinese Communist Party either let's slip out of that country or had something well, to do with it. You know and in fighting that war, we are sparing no expense in terms of getting the weapons we need to fight it. Okay, well, let's talk about the Defense Production Act. Sure. You issued a report just today about it. Why don't you tell me a little bit about what it is and how it's being used? The Defense Production Act goes back to uh, 1950, after World War II. During World War II, we had DPA-like authorities to mobilize uh, the, the defense industrial base. So today's DPA has three main authorities to get stuff done. You've got Title I, which allows you to, to prioritize orders so that uh, if a manufacturer of a critical piece of PPE needs something from the supply chain, they can grab it ahead of the line of some non-critical industry. So that's a tremendous important tool. Title III is basically a funding mechanism to stand up the kinds of factories that we need in order to meet our PPE needs, our testing needs, uh, the things we need for vaccines such as vials, and uh, we've, we've used that repeatedly. So Title III is very, very important. And, and the way that works in terms of spending things, sometimes it's just long-term purchase commitments. Sometimes it's some grant money to stand up some investment first and then to produce. But the strategy behind all of this as we do this is to bring our medicines, our medical supplies, and our medical equipment supply chains home to America. We must do that. Right. We will beat this pandemic. We will beat it. But we cannot forget the lesson, the key lesson, which is we need to bring our pharma home and our equipment home. Yeah. Right, I understand. So a common refrain from critics has been that the DPA hasn't been used enough and that it wasn't used soon enough. What's your response to that? So on the soon enough, that's, that's uh, counterfactual. Uh, if you look at the executive orders, uh, they begin in March. Uh, quite aggressively. So we had six executive orders and four presidential memorandum where we were using it. So, so that's when that, that began. Um, and in terms of aggressive enough, this, this again is counterfactual, and I think it reflects a misunderstanding of what the DPA uh, actually can and should do. I, I think that, you know, in the, in the Biden, Pelosi, Democrat world, you're supposed to, hang on, you're supposed to go in and seize factories and, and, and take over production. But the DPA really doesn't entitle you to do that. Our strategy has been basically to go in and use it forcefully 
when we've had to, which primarily is the case of GM and, and 3M, and then let the rest of corporate America understand that if, if they don't do what they should do, we're coming after them. And that's been very effective. From the time that that action was taken, mm -hmm. it was 17 days for that factory to be stood up. That has never been done in American industrial history. Well, I, we put that factory up in 17 days using the miracle of repurposing the platform of General Motors for autos. This was just like World War II when we took platforms for autos and turned them into well, tanks. We spoke with, this was done in 17 days. We spoke days. with Ventec and they, they said that they were already working on they were on making 25 production to, without the TPA. Yeah, and they were making 25 to 30 ventilators a week and they had no hope of going to the kind of scale that we went. I wanna, I wanna pivot, that, that is a miracle. I want to pivot a little bit and yeah. talk about masks for a second. Can we talk one thing about timing? I mean, I'd like to talk a little bit about this whole timing issue. The first major action that was taken on this was January 31st, which was when the president courageously pulled down the flights from China. And, and three days before, he had already made that decision. And I, my task was to go into the Situation Room and, and present the case for taking down the flights. Well, I, to, I, I'd, but, I, don't, I don't really want to go there only because I'd really like to focus on but you're, you're, supply you're, chain you're, you're issues here. You're implying that, that, but you, you'll want to listen to this, okay? Because it, it tells you what we were doing in February. Do you want to hear that? Yes, absolutely. All right, well, let me tell you what we were doing in February because come January 31st, the president pulls the flights down. Tw January 28th, I had gone into the Situation Room knowing he was going to do that to make the case the memo, I think you've seen the memo that I wrote, warning of a global pandemic, okay? So in February, we weren't sure what was going to happen with the China virus. We didn't know how bad it was going to be. But privately, the president's direction to me was prepare for the worst. So I was working day and night with people over at BARDA and other people in the bureaucracy, and we were getting ready as, as in, in that month, in February, we were getting ready to, to put out contracts for what would become the vaccine horse race. We were putting out, getting ready to put out contracts to buy remdesivir for clinical trials and to buy enough remdesivir for the American people. We were getting ready to put out contracts for things like vials and things like that. So all the work that we were doing in February laid the groundwork for the contracts that would be issued March, April, May, June, July, and now August. You can't, you can't, these things don't happen overnight. Well, let, let's focus on in February. Sure. You wrote a memo here, uh, and it was a request for immediate action, and it was on February 9th. And you said that action needed to be immediately undertaken, and immediately is twice in all caps, and you recommend halting the export of N95 masks and ramping up production of domestic N95 factories. And but what it did, we but did, that, what but we, neither of those things no, happened on, until April. No, what we did there, um, working with HHS and BARDA, was we set in motion all of those contracts that would be signed. But why did they take two months? Uh, <laughs> it, well, I'm, I'm questioning, I'm not, uh, I'll question your, your two months thing. The ones you're seeing there say two months. There's other contracts that have been signed outside the scope of that. But I can assure you, we were moving as early as, as, as the beginning of February, lining all this stuff up. And remember, like, now hang on, just remember, um, Nancy Pelosi was still dancing in Chinatown without a mask saying that there was no problem. I know you don't want to hear that know, on this, this program. No, no, no. But I... in February, there was like this blissful ignorance. The only, the two people that matter most around here in February who knew that could be the contrary was the president himself and me, and his direction to me was crystal clear. Get moving on this in case it's bad. And so but I, uh, that... I will, I mean, history will show, and there's, there's, there's many more memos than the ones that got leaked and shame on the leakers that show that we were on top of this game and everything that we did in February when we weren't sure what the virus was going to be in terms of degree of severity bore fruit but in week, the later months. A week after this memo, you wrote another one and you were still asking questions about, about was, why, why the, purpose, the exports now, weren't The purpose being of those memos 
were to continue to mobilize the bureaucracy, okay? I have an expression I call Trump time, which is to say, move as quickly as possible. And the problem that, that, that we have had here in the White House, and every president has, is a, bu a bureaucracy of, of career bureaucrats who are set in their ways and don't know how to move in Trump time. But, but I'll tell you what, I mean, this whole vaccine thing, it's worth talking about the vaccine development, okay? Yeah. Here's what we did. Well, hang on, I actually just sure. want to pause for one second, sure. though. I mean, who's, who's really in charge of, of the DPA and making those decisions, though? I mean, that would be, that's not the, the bureaucracy. That's the president of the United president. States and is he, in charge of the DPA, right. and, and we and started he, that process well, on but March I, 18th. Hang on, I, I just have one question. Before March the World 18th, Health though, Organization said we were in a pandemic. But March before. 18th, that's, that's, that's weeks after you were warning about this. And I think he said something like, now, you know, I, I'm not, you know, it would be I, I'm not going with this narrative. What I'm trying to tell you, and you're not listening, is that we were working very hard to put in motion everything we did with the DPA uh, as early as Jan starting, the starting gun in this crisis was January 31st when the president pulled down those flights. And, and I, we were, we were working 24-7. I mean, I'm, I'm sitting on the weekend in my office in this building and with, with three other guys, like, we're trying to, to get the ventilator thing done. We're talking in one day to 12, oh. almost a dozen ventilator manufacturers. And guess what? No American was denied a ventilator, number one. Number two, we went from a shortage position now to being the export ventilator king because of the way we move in Trump time. So I'm not buying it. You know, these criticisms, it's like you move too slow. What I'm trying to give you is information to the American public about what we were doing in February, which set up all the good things that happened in the later months. You have spoken about bringing medical manufacturing back to the U.S. and yes, it's actually kind of become a bipartisan issue at this point. Do you Not think kind of, it is a bipartisan do issue, you, yes. I believe. So Although do you, the Democrats talk, but don't walk the talk. Do you think talk. that it can really happen? It's already economy. happening. I mean, look, the president is the only person who's ever stood up to China in the Oval Office. And what's been happening over the last three and a half years, and we've seen this, is supply chains moving back to America for, for a whole variety of things. What this China virus pandemic has done is shine a really bright light on the fact that we're dangerously dependent on the Chinese Communist Party for antibiotics, for all sorts of masks, equipment, and we know that they, in terms of times of crisis, will hoard that stuff. So yes, I think, I think that we have a commitment now to bring that back. But I'll tell you what, the worst thing we can do is forget what happened here. Joe Biden and Barack Obama, in their administration, had a wake-up call with the H1N1 virus, okay? What they should have done after that was onshore all our N95 respirators. And instead, you know what they did? They sent them to Mexico and China well, actually, so that they could buy them three well, cents that's, less. But that's interesting that you bring up H1N1. You know, we have talked to some companies that ramped up during H1N1, and then yes. they felt abandoned because there weren't guarantees of, they purchasing, were abandoned. of purchasing that product they later. They were abandoned, so and I this, know who you talked to. Is this administration committed yes. to guaranteeing a certain amount of, of orders for companies that are so prepared to ramp the, up. The whole strategy has to be long-term commitments from the administration, but, but that won't do it alone. So if you think about pharmaceuticals, this is really interesting. Right now, the disadvantage we have in the pharmaceutical space is in traditional manufacturing, the three-stage process, it goes to the slave labor, the pollution havens, and the tax havens, boom, out. The only way we get our cost advantage back is by bringing home and developing advanced and continuous manufacturing. That is a process where you do all three stages at once, or at least two out of three, that reduces the waste stream, it reduces the cost, and voila, we're competitive. So we need to be innovative and competitive on the one hand, but we also have to have the commitment as a government for these long-term commitments. So we were talking about the challenges of bringing manufacturing yeah. back to the U.S. I mean, how can it happen? You're an economist, right? Prestige Ameritech has told us that 
they could buy a Chinese mask for less than the cost of materials for them. So, I mean, isn't it just a numbers game? Well, that's what China does. They dump products into our markets. That's how they stole all our jobs. I mean, remember during the 2000s, this was on Bush's watch, Obama and Biden. What China did was basically dump products into our markets, kill our factories. 70,000 factories we lost, 5 million manufacturing jobs during that time. Uh, in order for us to bring our pharma home, we got to do a bunch of things. The president just signed um, an essential medicines executive order uh, just a couple of weeks ago. What does that do? It's pure Trump. It's buy American so that Defense Department, Veterans Affairs, and Health and Human Services are directed to buy their pharmaceuticals from domestic manufacturers. Buy American is a critical part of this administration. The second thing, which is pure Trump, is the deregulation portion. Now, don't let that scare Americans. We're not gonna do anything dangerous. What this does is simply bring the FDA into a world where their regulatory processes have to work with these new advanced manufacturing processes. They're not built for that right now. And the third, third part of that is the innovation, which is to, to move uh, advanced manufacturing forward. So you've got the Buy American portion of it. You've got the expenditures we're making with long-term commitments, 10, 10 years, 15 years out. So these, these companies will have a firm commitment to it. Uh, we are also, uh, with the strategic national stockpile, we have a smart stockpile this time. We're not only adding more material to the stockpile, but we're expanding its capacity by going first to the distributors to have them maintain reserve capacity. It's kind of like electric power plant notion where you have kind of spinning reserves that you can bring online. Uh, and then same thing with the hospital. So everybody holds more inventory. You do a first in, first out, so the stuff remains fresh. So we're attacking this. What the Trump administration does is it attacks it like a business person would from multiple vectors of attack with the goal of having the jobs here, the factories here, and Americans safe. So I want to go back to ventilators for a second. Sure. You mentioned really being involved in, in sure. ventilators. Yes. So we've been looking at one particular contract, the ventilator contract with Philips, and we understand that it was negotiated first under the Obama administration, and those ventilators that were ordered were never actually delivered to the SNS, and that contract was renegotiated. Those were a prototype. They were supposed to be very cheap ventilators that never got done because some company bought the company. Is that the one you're talking about? Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't want to, what I don't want to do is comment on on stuff unless you give me very specific things. What I, what I can say to you about- So there, the criticism has been yeah. that this administration is allowing taxpayers to pay five times more for what is functionally the same ventilator as see, the, see, the that's, previous- that, that's, No, no, and, yeah. and, and, and yeah. this is coming from a, a congressional report. Of so. course, it's a democratic congressional report. Well, it's pure- But uh, I look, know that you're it, a negotiator, so look, I, I just look, wanna ask you what really sure. happened because I know that you I'll had a seat you, at the I'll table tell you what happened. and I wanted to give you a chance to, to sure. tell us. The, the first thing that happened is the Democrats wanna blame Donald J. Trump for the pandemic and they're, they're, they don't wanna have this election run on legitimate issues about what the American people want, which is the economy, standing up to China and law and order in our cities. They, they want to basically make the pandemic. So they do letters like this. Let me tell you about ventilators. All ventilators are not created equal, right? You have some smaller portable ventilators, and then you have like the Cadillac General Electric $43,000 one, which will stay on through 14 days in an IC unit. ICU unit, lasts the whole 14 days without any change. And everywhere in between, you have variations on that theme. So you can't compare the price of this ventilator with that ventilator without controlling for their functionality. So you're saying okay? they're very different. They're very different, okay. yes. Okay, because the and report so, says they're yeah, so, the same. I mean, what I love about the GM Ventec one, uh, and I went to the factory to actually visit it and look at it, um, is to me, it's, it's one of the most elegant designs. It runs about $15,000. But even that ventilator doesn't have the full functionality of the GE one. I mean, if, it, 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 you'd love to have all GE ones, but at $43,000, that's expensive and it also takes much longer to produce. So what we're trying to do 
uh, across, I mean, it's kind of like um, a hedged portfolio that, that someone would have in their 401k, right? We've got, I think it's somewhere, at least nine, 10 different types of producers and they produce different ventilators with different functionality. So look, you get, look, just <laughs> memo to anybody uh, reading a uh, letter from Congress uh, that's totally partisan. Um, guess what, that's partisan, so. Can you tell me when you think those Philips ventilators will be delivered? Wh which, Phil, I don't know which ones you're talking about. I do know that Philips has been producing some ventilators. One criticism for this Philips contract is sure. that Philips got several extensions, and so those ventilators aren't expected to be delivered until I, look, 2022. I, I, so. I can't comment on, on the, the I, that's, to me, that's just garbage stuff. That's just typical Democratic BS. Okay, they're playing politics with the lives of the American people. Stop that, stop that. And so um, all I can tell you is, is we've become- Well, I mean, uh, it's taxpayer money, well, but though. Look, I mean, look, it's, 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 yeah, but, but <laughs> let's also be clear about one thing. When Governor Cuomo, with his hair on fire, started screaming on national television that he needed 40,000 ventilators, more than we had in the strategic national stockpile. He did tremendous damage to this country because all of the 49 other states started getting crazy about ventilators and there was real fear on the part of the American people. Guess what? Guess what? We are now the ventilator king of the world. We're shipping ventilators to not, not just for, for export, for money, but we're giving them to our friends so and allies. I, this, you don't think there's an it's, urgency it's for It's democratic, it? not, is what? You don't think there's an urgency for these orders to be delivered before 2022? These orders? No. No, I, we're, we're in great shape with ventilators. We're great, and I'm, it's not clear to me that we haven't got some now. I don't know, I don't know the particulars of the, con you, you're just sitting there with papers saying Phillips, 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 and that's not fair to me. I'm sorry, this is the invoice that was sent, if you wanna look at it. It's it's from the it's it's from the congressional report, but I, it, I it is addressed not, to you. I will not go there. What I would do, if you want, is next time you want to do an interview with me, have the courtesy of giving me the material to study beforehand, because that that's just a cheap shot. Oh, here's the no no no, not a cheap shot cheap at all. Shot. I was asking to explain what really happened because cheap there's shot. been a lot of criticism. Yeah, but uh, and know, I was giving you a chance to look, tell us what really you're happened. You're dwelling you're dwelling on something that's that's tiny in the scheme of things. And that's why I always worry about these kind of interviews because if the American people really wanna know what's happening, it's not what may or may not be happening with a single contract with Phillips, okay? Cause that's just pure political BS, okay? That's all you're doing here. If you wanna play that game and put it on the air, fine. But put this on the air, that's just BS. There's a lot of other things that the American people need to know about which I've shared with you in the course of this interview. So I'll, I'll, do, I'll say the same thing I said it's the 60 minutes. If you wanna put stuff like that in there, air the whole interview so people can see the whole thing. I'm serious about that. You, you do stuff like that and I, I, I want the whole interview up on the web. I mean, let's do that. You, you shouldn't have anything to fear, fear from that. Let's do no, it, no, go. No, actually does have a transparency project and if you're saying you're gonna sit here and answer our questions, then I will talk to our executive yeah. about yeah. putting this whole thing Put it on. on. I just want to get my papers straight. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you staying. Well, I, I do enjoy watching your, your, your program. Um, I, I've watched it for decades, I think. Um, but, um, you know, there's always the concern about fairness, but it, we'll, we'll see what happens. So like, you, you yeah. famously accused China of nationalizing 3M. So we wanted to ask you sure. where that came from. Well, that's what they did. What China... What the Chinese Communist Party, to be clear, did was uh, through the restrict 3M from exporting their N95 masks outside of China to America. That, that, that was done, okay? And um, the bigger 3M issue, which I, which I think is interesting, goes to the problem that I call the Vatican problem. There's too many American multinational corporations who think they're the Vatican. They're their own separate nation where they have uh, clients in America, in China, all over the world, either producing or consuming. And, and from the, their perspective as executives, their role is to balance all of those interests rather than serve the American nation in time of need. 
And so the problem we had with 3M, uh, which required a Defense Production Act order, uh, was that they, they were simultaneously trying to play some games with where their masks were going. At the same time, they were in a vice put on them by the Chinese Communist Party. So we had to handle those problems in two different ways. The first way was to use the DPA to order them to give us uh, an allotment of masks, and they were able to dramatically both increase the allotment of existing capacity, but also stand up new capacity. The second, the other problem we had where the Chinese government, the Chinese Communist Party was, was putting the screws to 3M, is we handled that through diplomacy very successfully. So I, I would say that that, that was a, a, a beautiful case of how this administration works, where we, we, we came again a multi-vector attack. Well, we spoke to 3M, and they completely disagree that it was nationalization. I mean, they said that the Chinese government requested preference and a higher degree of engagement in addressing the orders for everything we were shipping out of this <clears throat> Shanghai facility. <laughs> and Me memo to frontline here. This is why we had to do the DPA order on them. They, they are the slipperiest people that I, that I dealt with in this White House in terms of getting to yes on things. So if they're spinning it that way, they can go ahead and spin it. But I'm telling you flat out that the Chinese Communist Party, both at the federal level and at the local level, I think that it was in Shanghai, was prohibiting those masks from leaving China. And we had, no, we had to deal with that diplomatically and we had to deal with it with the DPA. And I'm telling you, I don't care what 3M says, that's what happened. But is that different than the functions of the DPA that say that we can block exports of masks from our country? What that does is it underscores with an exclamation point why we have to have this production here, why we have to have it here. And we've been very, very good about working with other countries of the world in terms of sharing what there is to make sure people stay alive. But the fact of the matter is over 80 countries put export restrictions of some kind on the rest of the world. And this is a dog eat dog world when it's a pandemic. And that's what we need to understand. And that's why I get back to this president, Donald J. Trump, toughest president we've ever had since Ronald Reagan. And he's, he's handling this with a combination of toughness using the DPA, the diplomacy behind the scenes, and our mission is to protect the American people from the China virus. And, and that's, that's what happened with 3M. And I, you, I don't care what else you say, they said, I tell you, I've, I've told you what happened. How are you gonna convince American companies to come back from China? Well, we don't have to convince them to come back from China. Uh, China, China, uh, China took a fork in the road um, first in 2008 when they overplayed their hand and, and this whole uh, hide your capabilities, bide your time strategy going back to Jung, Deng Xiaoping, they threw that in the garbage can, right? And they started getting really aggressive with the rest of the world. Xi Jinping comes along and he's doing just crazy stuff like this civil military fusion. Have you heard of this? Do you know what this well, doctrine is? Well, do, do you know what that no. is? Civil military fusion is a doctrine that says that anything a company has, foreign or domestic, on Chinese soil in terms of data, trade secrets, whatever, must be given on demand to the Chinese Communist Party. And that, that is the single most important thing that's chilling new investment in the People's Republic of China. So yeah, people are coming back in droves to this country because of, of President Trump's policies and because they're afraid of the Chinese Communist Party.